So I grew up in, in I was born and raised in Durham, which uh, has a very rich African American history. And uh, as a consequence of that, I have an appreciation growing up, uh, you know, watching, I'm uh, learning about, you know, C.C. Uh, Spaulding, who was the president of uh, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance, and John Herbie Wheeler, who was the president of Mechanics and Farmers Bank, and I had professional parents who actually knew some of those people and that kind of thing. Um, so when we begin to talk about slavery, we have to kind of contextualize that, and we, we can kind of see how far African Americans have come. Uh, this, this particular project, though, gives us an opportunity, I think, for the first time in this space, and I say that meaning North Carolina's history, to really uh, begin to flesh out what slavery was here in North Carolina. Uh, slavery had a way of eroding the humanity of African Americans in the eyes of whites and even for African Americans, it has been a struggle. So the more that we are able to have conversations about it factually, based on research and so forth, I think that that is a real benefit for us. And that's, that's in part why this people, uh, People's Not Property uh, project is so important. Well, the whole idea, obviously, is that, you know, you have to create a, a slave, you know, a person that uh, is born free, uh, has certain ideas about what they are going to do and not do. So you have to create a slave mentality, and that is a process. So we have to understand that process, and that, that process included denuding the slave of their culture, and by culture we mean their language, their beliefs, and, and values, and so forth, and then replacing those with ideas that were suitable for someone who was going to be uh, working as a bonded person, as, as an enslaved person. So uh, the, the, that process of, of denuding African Americans has stripped African Americans of an understanding of who they are, and that's so important because we determine what we think we can do, oftentimes based upon what we've come from, who we were. So if, uh, in the words of John Henry Clark, he said it this way, if you start in slavery and talking about African American history, for example, you'll think uh, black people have come a long way. You know, but if you started with African societies, Mali, Ghana, Songhai, and so forth, and you came forward, then you would see, wow, this is an episode in the history of African descended people where we have for a very long time uh, lost out in, you know, in, uh, frankly, an economic competition over scarce resources. So, uh, but again, I, and, and I think this, this, this project, the People Not Property Project, allows us to kind of delve into now um, where, in point of fact, um, slaves were concentrated, uh, what their value was, what their value was relative to what they were doing, and so forth. So there's a whole lot of other things that come out of that. But that, that human uh, aspect of it is, a, is the piece that I think is, is really important. And it's important for whites, clearly, but it's also important for African Americans to, to understand and appreciate you know, what has happened so we can understand ourselves better. Well, so I'm always, I'm one of those people who feels like it's, we have to root ourselves. So, uh, and by that, I mean, we have to know, we, we really have to know who we are. And that's why, in fact, I became a historian, is I wanted to be able to help young people to understand who they are so that they have a good conception of themselves and they go into the world and they can compete. Uh, well, part of that for me is it starts at home. It starts with your genealogy, right? So what we're teaching and we study uh, African history or African American history or African diaspora history, you really have to start with yourself because you have to, you have to place yourself in the continuity of those larger histories. How do you relate? How do you connect? 
So one of the exercises that I do, for example, is I have all of my students do a genealogy project in my lecture courses. I force them to do it. And the reason that I do that is when I was a youngster, I wish I had had someone to do that for me so that I could have sat down with elders who are now gone and asked just some very basic questions to get information. And that's, that's so important because uh, when we set out to do genealogical research, and that's what we're talking about, for African Americans, we come up a, a, a against a number of challenges in doing that. Uh, one is the first one, even before we get to 1870 that you mentioned is important, is the 1890 census burned. And what you have out of that is what I found in my own uh, research and experience is that for many of the women who were born just after slavery, their names just change, their names, excuse me, change at, during that period. And it is very difficult now to figure out where to try to find them again. So that 1890 census burning actually was, had a very significant impact, I think. Then, and there's parts of it, but, but much of that, the 1890 census is, is, not, accept, is not accessible. So, uh, and, and to the 1870, and then I'll let, you, I'll let you come back and ask me what you want to ask. 1870 for African Americans, obviously, you know, that is, that's that first decade uh, where the census is being taken, where we are, at least in name, free people. Uh, so, but after, before that, we have to go to the slave schedules, and you're trying to compare ages to who you think, and, and uh, as you know, in the census, people didn't oftentimes know for certain, especially in that period, when they were born, so they were guesstimating. So, you, you very well might align an age for someone with a relative and not have them if they're close in age, you could be mixing mixing them up and so forth. But that is a real challenge at crossing that 1870 uh, barrier. But there's ways that, you know, that, that we can work around them. So the slave schedule was a instrument used by the United States government to track, uh, in part for tax purposes, uh, the property that, uh, the human property that, that was held to service. So what that would look like typically is it would have no names, but it would have uh, ages, sometimes age ranges uh, of the people that were, that were being held. And you could count to, to determine how many people, uh, how many pieces of property uh, were held and, and in many cases, you know, their age. But it was just, a, it was a way for the, for the government to keep track of that, like I said, principally for tax purposes. The 1890 census, Burn uh, and that is, you know, it's uh, it's it's really really unfortunate. Uh, in my family, in particular, you know, there are people that I lose because I can't I can't access that information in, in the 1890 census. So uh, I want to say maybe only 10 percent of of that 1890 census, or some small amount of it still exists, but you know, but all of that is, you know, all of that is lost to us. So we're having to rely heavily on, that's it. You think about it, so you go 1880, where you got people, right? And then 1900, now with men, our names don't change when we get married. So oftentimes we can go back and find them. Women who got married in 1888, 1885, in uh, 1892, and the like, now their names have changed. So now you've got to try to figure out, you know, how to find them. If they stay local, you might be able to. Uh, and this, this project, this People Not Property project is really talking about primary records and how important those are. So that illusion is true. I'll give you an example. Uh, my, my mother's people are from Little Rock and there is a cemetery there where many of my family members are, are buried. And after integration, uh, desegregation, uh, someone burned many of the burial records for uh, the cemetery. And this is where the African-Americans were, were, many of them were, were buried. 
and it was just a malicious act to prevent people from being able to find loved ones and so forth. You know, fortunately, we have find a grave now. People go out and do cemetery census where they actually just go out to the different grave markers. But some of those graves are not marked. You know, it turned out I was very fortunate in that my grandmother, I came from a, uh, my, my parents were professional, but they came from very poor backgrounds. They were uh, uh, materially speaking. Uh, but where my grandmother was buried, they didn't have money for a headstone initially. Uh, so when I went to do the research, the person was able to go at a different cemetery and pull up the records and say, no, this is, we know the different plots and this is where your grandmother is, is buried. You know, but these, these records that speak to our experience are, you know, are, are so important to, to helping us to understand, uh, understand our past. The, the challenge that we have is as a nation, we have yet to have an open and honest conversation about the impact of slavery, what it has meant. So now you are starting to get uh, scholars, you know, Seven Beckert and the Empire of Cotton, you know, Edward Baptist, uh, the half has never been told, who are really looking at quantifying what it has meant economically, not just to the United States, King Cotton fed uh, Europe, Asia, I mean, everybody used cotton, right? So we have yet to really have an honest conversation on that side and on what has it meant to African Americans to have had uh, that period or episode in their history. And what I see is that oftentimes uh, we treat enslavement as if we were sort of the poster children of coerced labor and that African Americans, because it was so late in history when African Americans became enslaved, uh, in other parts of the world that different forms of coerced labor were taking the place of what would become chattel bond slavery in the Americas, not right? just the U.S. and it's important to stress that. All right, so uh, because we haven't had this, this conversation, our friends in the white community don't really understand. They're hesitant to ask. African Americans treat it like it's a stigma and they don't want to deal with it oftentimes. I, I get that. Our schools increasingly don't want to teach and talk about it. But we can't understand ourselves without it, right? It's like the elephant in the room that everyone is attempting to avoid when there's a reality to it, you know? So I think the healthy thing to do is for people to open up and to talk about, to begin having conversations about this, right? Because it, it really does shape how we view one another. It shapes so many, so many things uh, in terms of our social interaction and, and, and so forth. So uh, it's, it's really, really, you know, it's really important and it's very impactful, very impactful. Uh, I've seen uh, students who, after we have, and I teach, you know, slavery at North Carolina Central University as part of what I do in U.S. history, once they get a better sense of what has transpired, they understand better. White kids and black kids, they understand better, you know, uh, and it's painful, it's painful, because that was a very painful episode but we have a much better understanding of it. So it's, it's, it's hugely, hugely important. The largest number of Africans were brought to South America, I mean, to Brazil, right out of West Central Africa, right? And then the Caribbean, the United States received approximately the same number that went to the island of Barbados, to put it in perspective. And many of those Barbadians, of Asians, if you will, ended up coming to South Carolina and parts of North Carolina when those opened up for settlement because they couldn't uh, get land in Barbados, the sons of the planters and so forth. But they did play off of each other, so that's, that's important. But as I, as, I, as I mentioned also, if you look at Edward Baptist uh, in The Half Has Never Been Told, I think that is an excellent resource for people who are wanting to understand at least uh, the impact of King Cotton.
uh, he goes into detail in talking about the that economic impact. You know, uh, slaves were property and they were expensive. Uh, so much so that I actually I was giving a talk down in Chatham County, and I went and looked it up to get a sense, but. It, the number of people who owned slaves was roughly about 13, 14%. They could afford them, they could afford slaves. Uh, and that was roughly the same percentage of people who can afford Mercedes in, uh, you know, in Atlanta today, I put it, you know, to, to kind of compare that. And just like uh, that property, because it was expensive, they had to take out a mortgage to be able to pay for that property. And what that meant was, one, that could impact how they treated that property because since it was so valuable, you couldn't just de destroy it. Um, uh, but the other side was there were things that you could do with that, right? You could take loans off of that property to buy more property, whether it was real property in terms of land or more human property in terms of uh, people who were enslaved to work that land. And the banks didn't just sit on those instruments, right? They bundled those and then they oftentimes sold those to, uh, to financial institutions in New York who then used them up on Wall Street, right? So people bought that debt. So you can see now how we get from uh, Durham or Chatham or you know some county in, or Guilford County in North Carolina to now we're influencing uh, the international markets, financial markets uh, through enslavement. Mm -hmm. So you know and I think uh, I have a student, a uh, young man named Kyrie Mason who is going through the deeds records in Orange County and he is noticing how frequently actually people are slow, sold. Oftentimes they're, they're sold between family members and we're, you know, we're tracking that information. So uh, for our component of the People Not Pro uh, Property Project, uh, if you look at, um, for example, the Yamasee War of 1715, if you look at that war, that really was a war to end enslavement of the Indian uh, the Indian peoples who were living in that uh, in that uh, South Carolina North Carolina region so that would be the Congri, uh the PD the uh, Catawba you know down in the Charlotte region and so forth they all combined to go against the British and they literally pushed them to the limits over that and it effectively ended for the most part the indigenous slave trade that war did so that was that was very significant and that is another one of those aspects of history that unfortunately just isn't talked about so people don't really know or don't really have appreciation for you know for that uh, the other that I wanted to comment on was that and I'll get in to talk about the different regions a little bit but I wanted to comment on the Donnell family so there's a Clyde Donnell who is uh, one of Durham's favorite sons. Clyde Donnell is from Guilford County, North Carolina. And if I had known you were gonna talk or bring him up, I would have looked because I've done, I've done his family's genealogy and some research that I'm doing. But he went to North Carolina A&T, uh, and I think he finished North Carolina A&T in about 1911. Uh, no, uh, earlier than that, because he went from A&T's prep program up to Howard University and from Howard to Harvard University Medical School. He finished, finished Howard in 1911, finished Harvard's medical school in 1915. And then he went from Howard and came to Durham. Durham was at that time one of the few places where there was a hospital, Dr. Aaron McDuffie Moore, had helped to establish Lincoln Hospital in Durham, which helped to draw people to Durham. So. North Carolina Mutual, 1898. Uh, he was one of the founders of North Carolina Mutual. And what they found is uh, blacks had, because of poverty, had such serious health problems that they needed a medical component to go out and help educate mm -hmm. African-Americans about health care and nutrition and so on and so forth. 
So Dr. Donnell joined Dr. Aaron McDuffie Moore and they created a department within North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, then called North Carolina Mutual Life and Provident Association, if I recall correctly. And they did that kind of educational work for a long time. And when uh, Aaron McDuffie Moore passed, I believe in 1923, he became the medical director for North Carolina Mutual from that time until 1956 when he was replaced by Charles D. Witt Watts, who was another prominent uh, African-American in Durham. But Clyde Donnell, though, this is a son of Greensboro, Guilford County, you know, and I'm, I'm willing to bet you he probably has some relationship to, you know, to those, to the uh, Donnells that, you, that, that you're talking about. I would be surprised if he did not. Many of these families are still here. So I'll give you another example. So I had a project that it could, it's ongoing. We were in competition for a Z. Smith Reynolds uh, Public Art Initiative grant. And we made it to the semifinal rounds and got bumped out at that point, but we're gonna continue to work. Uh, and that's what a community in Durham called Bragtown. Now Bragtown is right down the road from Stagville. And Stagville was, Stagville is now a uh, blanket sort of umbrella term, if you will, for multiple plantations. But uh, it was part of the property holdings of the Benihan and Cameron family. And that was arguably the largest plantation in the state. It was 30,000 acres, 30,000. So many of the families that had been held a service on that Stagville and then across from Stagville, it was a line almost like you can see here. Stagville was in the east and then just west of that was a Snow Hill Plantation, all of them, both of them very large and then there was Southern Land Holdings. If you know where the Falls Lake area is off of 85, you cross over Falls Lake, all that was a Stagville Plantation and that's another problem we need to talk about. Many of these early historic locations, like Lake Gaston and Kerr Lake, buried, you know, uh, I've talked to Earl Imes, you might know about this. They, they buried uh, what were very old Okanichi, Saponi, Tutelo areas, places that I am convinced African Americans, and probably uh, early on in that early period, uh, indentured servants were running, they were coming right down the Okanichi Trail from Bermuda 100, you know, and they were, there was a huge town there that was trading and so forth, and from there they could go wherever they went. But I'm convinced that they, you know, that they were in that area, but Falls Lakes covers much of that Stagville plantation, but many of those families who have been held to service uh, at, at, at generally Stagville are still there, you know, and those names, uh, Alice Ely Jones at North Carolina Central University did wonderful research back in the 1980s uh, and wrote an MA thesis, you know, uh, about that. But she identified many of those families, so names like Bryant and uh, Dunnigan's and Goodlow's and so forth, and many of those people, you see those names very prominently in Durham's history. Amos or Amy was another one of those names, you know. So, and I, I was out there um, at Stagville, and they have photographs of these descendants because they started organizing meetings of these family members, and they had a picture of uh, Larry Suit, and I grew up playing ball with the Suit boys, you know, and I knew Mr. Suit well, you know. I had no idea that he had ties you know, to that particular plantation, but they did. So oftentimes, for example, in the establishment of Durham, that pioneer generation, they had come off of plantations, many of them that were local, of, of course, others had come from other places, uh, but many of them had come right from that local area. And as I see it, some of the reason that Durham would become, I, I like to argue, the most prominent black community in the United States for a long time in the 20th century was because of the ties across the railroad track between the prominent whites and those uh, black elites that they were helping to, to support and make a way for. I'm, I believe fundamentally one of the most important 
areas of study that people can undertake is the study of history. And the reason for that is historians, in part, are telling you who you are. We are. What we write and say about the past informs the present because we bring into the present the past. So it really matters who is telling the story. I often talk about this you know, to students to get them to understand. There are many paths, right? If we all see an event occur, we all have different perspectives on that event and what we're going to say about it is impregnated with oftentimes ties that we have to family and to other people that relates exactly to what you're talking about, where you have people who had, who had owned slaves or people who had uh, snuck into the slave quarters and, you know, and forced themselves on, on women and so forth, and that the kids that are born out of this and so forth. You know, uh, but it helps to, it helps us I think as a society to open up and to talk about, to have conversations about these kinds of things so that we can better understand ourselves and better understand our neighbors. Uh, we don't do this as an exercise to, uh, I don't, and I don't teach it as an exercise to be angry because you, you, if you internalize that, it will, it'll eat you up. Uh, but we have to do it so that we can, we can better understand ourselves and empower ourselves. And we are empowered by that knowledge and by that understanding. I will so I'll use my own family as an example. The family in Alabama that held my uh, people were the Moore family. And the slave owner, his name was William Moore. Uh, and they called him, and I know this because I recently received from, I did the, you remember Antoine Fisher? Okay, I, I played Antoine Fisher. So I was out on Ancestry like everyone else, and I found a relative, a woman, again, I lose them, I did uh, 1890, and for other reasons, the names change, and she was uh, my father's generation, my dad's 91. So uh, she came down through a different branch of the family tree that I felt if I could find her, it would open a whole, it would open my grandmother's people. They had, she, uh, her mother, my great grandmother had many siblings. It would open another tree going way, another branch of the tree going way back. Well, to make a long story short, uh, about 2011 or so, uh, on Ancestry, there was an obituary for her by name, and they had the actual obituary, and this is why obituaries are so important, because they named the next of kin. So I turned into Antoine Fisher, and I went searching for Deborah Ann Clifton, who is on faculty at University of Louisiana Lafayette. I said, how many sisters named Deborah Ann Clifton that are PhDs can be out there? You know, I'm sure it's a small number. So I, I got on Google, went and searched at University of Louisiana Lafayette, and I just put together a little email, put just enough family history so that she could know, you know, I, I was legit. And we had that conversation, and she shared information with me and introduced me to other family members. And as it turns out, the, the patriarch of the family was a man by London, Matthew Moore, who was a son of William Moore, he was, he was mixed. And uh, his wife, Sarah Ann, I thought Radford, but she was Sarah Ann Fields, we've learned recently. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what Cousin Debbie told me, she said, you know, the family called uh, uh, Mr. Moore, they called him Grandpa Will. And I couldn't get my head around that, man. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to understand that. But he, he refused to sell London. He had, London had a brother named Pompey, who, uh, another one that, you know, he, he had refused to sell. Pompey went on up to Michigan and became a physician. They were born in the late 1840s. Mm -hmm. So he went on to become a physician, I'm gonna guess somewhere in the, in the 1870s, 1880s, he becomes a physician. Um, but those were, you know, the ties, they're uncomfortable, they're contradictory, Right, London was married. I got it. I, what I was going to say is one of my other cousins, Jacqueline Campbell, 
just sent me the transcript to an interview done with one of uh, one of her uh, relatives, direct line of descent. We are we are related by blood, but she's a direct descendant of her. Her name was uh, uh, Ellie uh, Powell, and this was done in 1979, 1980. And she said, you know, in the transcript, she said, you know, London and Sarah were married at the assistance of Billy Moore in his dining room parlor. And he was a big planner in Coosa County. I'm trying to get my head around it in, in a certain sense, you know. But the reality is that slavery, slavery created um, relationships that I don't think people would understand or appreciate today, right? You know, and some of it, I think, frankly, was, uh, it's a lot of madness tied up in it, right? We need psychologists to study this thing. Uh, but uh, the reality is, uh, Billy Moore gave them property. And because they had property in the 19th century, that made them somebody's. They ended up literally having to go to guns from the whites who in other parts of the community to fight to keep that property, you know. But I, I believe that in not all instances, uh, where not everyone was a Billy Moore, certainly. Uh, but there, you did see that. And I, and I feel like I'm seeing that as I'm studying Durham's history, you know. Uh, as I look at it and some of the different folks who have come up and have been very prominent, many of them were interracial people. And, you know, I think that they are, in some ways, you know, you're looking at, uh, at, uh, at Carr and you're looking at, at Duke and these other folks, you know, they crossed the railroad tracks too. And there was something that kept the crazies at bay in Durham that didn't keep them at bay in Wilmington, that didn't keep them at bay in Tulsa, that didn't keep them at bay. We can just go on and on and on with that. In Memphis, you mentioned Memphis, it was another place in 1866. So, and I think it was oftentimes those prominent men who had ties, they had direct ties to, you know, to, to folks in the black community. Not in all cases, but enough that it made a difference. Yeah, but this is some really serious work. It's really important work this, uh, that what the students are getting out of it, I think is really important also, because for my kids, for, all of them, truthfully. This is the first time that they're dealing with primary documents. And they're getting to see, it's, it's different than reading a book, you know. And yet they're not holding the actual documents because they're looking at, you know, microfilm and so forth. But reading the actual letters now, it's unfiltered. And I'm saying many of them are being reeled in by that. And it's helping them to grow intellectually, you know. And we're having some really rich conversations of the consequence of that, which is really, really good. That slavery was different in different parts of the state, right? Um, so, and we know that we have the coastal plain, and then we had the Piedmont and the mountain region, and the largest plantations, on average, were in that coastal plain region. And many of those, it looked much more like the slavery that grew up in South Carolina where it was a plantationocracy uh, in that coastal plain in North Carolina. Uh, but for the reason that I told you earlier about the people coming out of Barbados and out of the Caribbean, where the plantations there were, could be enormous, you know. If you took, uh, uh, of interest, you took Haiti, for example, um, Plantation Breda, which is where uh, Toussaint Louverture had been held. There were 2,000 enslaved Africans on that plantation. So they had, you know, really, really large plantations there. So you had a similar kind of development, certainly not that large, but large plantations in South Carolina, large plantations on average in the coastal plain. Uh, and what that meant oftentimes is that in areas where you had large numbers of Africans who were held, they were able to retain aspects of their culture that they could not, for example, in the Piedmont region, where slavery was uh, typically, uh, with a few exceptions, there were large plantations in Charlotte and Wake, and I've already mentioned uh, uh, Cameron and Benahan Holdings in Durham. Um, but by and large, you had smaller holdings where you had 
uh, slaves actually working in the field alongside the whites in small numbers. Well, that also meant that uh, one, that slaveholder probably wasn't going to physically abuse that slave to the extent that they could not work because they probably could not afford to replace them. Uh, but it also meant that that owner had oversight over them and control of their lives in ways that on a larger plantation, you still have control, but in your you have more space to hang on to aspects of your culture, whether it is your religion and beliefs and so forth. So if you take the Sea Islands, for example, and the Gullah people, uh, that's why you, know, you see that. I still think of Cornelia Bailey, who was out there, and she, she went, um, there's a, a, a great film by Sheila, uh, by Sheila Walker. Um, and I, if, I, if it comes to me, I, I'll share it. But she has a great film and she talks about, she interviews Cornelia Bailey, who went to the Senegambia region of Africa uh, with other members from those sea islands. And she was like, it was just like home. The people there were like asking like, are you from here? And she said, I guess so. You know, it's just over time, but they were able to retain much of that. In the Piedmont, it was much more difficult because of the intimate relationships between and the small numbers of, of people who were who were being held. And then out in the West, even more so, you know, you had Yeoman farmers, you had, as you've noticed, as you mentioned earlier, the people that settled Guilford and going west oftentimes were coming out of Pennsylvania through the Shenandoah Valley and they were Quakers and and other folks. So you didn't have uh, nearly the, the number of, you know, like plantations, if you would, just small farmers and so forth. Um, so that shaped slavery, the, that shaped those communities differently. So slavery in those communities shaped those communities differently. Mindset is different. When you are living a much large number of people who are held captive, right? There's a lot of fear. You mentioned the slave codes. Well, the first one in North Carolina, 1715, right? I just told you, when was the Amnesty Revolt? 1715, that's the same time, same period as the Tuscarora. So it's like, we need to have, make sure that we maintain control. And we see the same thing happen 1831 after Nat Turner, you know, another set. We need another set of, of codes to make sure that we, you know, I think 1835, the state actually went after even free people of color and said, we need to make sure that we are maintaining control of them. So they lost the right to vote, to meet in groups and all sorts of things, 1835, you know, as a consequence of the, the help that they're giving to, you know, people who are enslaved because they have family members who are enslaved that they want to be able to pull out of that, all right? So that is how the state is, you know, how the state is responding to that. You know, so uh, a lot more work needs to be done, I feel, on that. You know, there's, there's the runaway aspect. I'll mention Freddie Parker, um, his work, you know, um, on runaway slaves. John Hope Franklin also has written on um, runaway slaves in uh, North Carolina. Great resource on uh, looking at the ads uh, for people, you know. One of the things that you get, you talked about uh, sort of the brutality of it, uh, that's shocking is the descriptions that they give for the enslaved people, you know. Ned missing an arm, gash across the neck, you know, I mean, the, the ad after ad describes them in ways where they're, you know, they're talking about scars and things that they, uh, you know, that as a consequence of having been enslaved that they received and so forth. So that's part of what you take from that. and. Anyone who ran off as an intelligent person and they ran off to, uh, not that you were unintelligent if you remained in, bi in bondage, but oftentimes uh, I like to explain that that way to my students. Instead of saying, well, they were militant, as I know, they were intelligent. If you're being held against your will, then you seek freedom like any clear thinking person would. And they ran off, as you said, to the Great Dismal Swamp. I just read something recently about people storing away on uh, ships, you know, out of New Bern and Wilmington and other places, you know, it got to be where they would have to, to burn pitch in the ships, you know, the pine pitch to, you know, create, a, to fumigate them to try to, before they went out to sea, to make sure that they didn't have uh, stowaways. 
a different Charles Johnson that's written an excellent uh, work of historical fiction called Middle Passage uh, that, that speaks to, you know, that speaks to that uh, to great extent. Uh, but many of them did. They stayed in the swamps uh, sometimes for up to a year. Uh, I'm convinced also that we were living in other places. I mentioned that Lake Gaston area that they flood. That's the Roanoke River, right? So, you know, that's just south of where the Dan and Roanoke come together, just east of that, if you will. But they were li living in those low-lying areas because they were difficult to get to. And, you know, people uh, essentially took an oath. Uh, literally to fight to the death to maintain their freedoms in those spaces, uh, in the maroon communities and so forth. So, um, you know, really, really, uh, uh, really fascinating, really important. And Arwen, I believe, has a student who is writing on those maroon communities, especially in spaces, because for a long time, there was sort of this idea that we didn't have maroonage in, you know, in places like North Carolina. You had it in Florida because they talk about the Seminoles or what have you, you know. Certainly in the Caribbean, South America, you know, in the mountains and so forth, you had Queen Manny and, you know, in Jamaica, you go on and on uh, with that. Um, you know, but now we're coming to understand that we had that kind of maroonage, uh, maybe not on the same scale, but we certainly had it in, uh, in North Carolina, Great Dismal Swamp, other places mm -hmm. as well. I, in fact, now that I think about it, I have a young man who's up at Columbia University, and he's writing on what he calls free towns and uh, free areas, and he is uh, looking at it during a period of slavery and colonialism globally. And for Buncombe County, he says he has maybe three sites in Buncombe County, North Carolina. So I'm looking forward to learning about, you know, to learning about that, where you had people during the period of slavery who were living free in Buncombe County, who had, you know, uh, stolen a little freedom, as Freddie Parker said. If you're talking about that colonial period, that early colonization period, if you will, uh, you know, truthfully, well into the 18th century, I mean, this is a back country, you know, where we are now, Guilford County was, I mean, this was, you know, this was, you know, the frontier. So, you know, if you were trying to get away and you were in those plantations that we've described, then, you know, you're probably headed this way to try to get away and you're mixing with the Native Americans, you know, and, uh, the, uh, you know, um, the indentured servants, did a similar kind of thing because that's the now that's an aspect of of history that is not really talked about. You know, Theodore Allen has a work in two volumes called *The Invention of the White Race*, and he talks about that you know indented servitude, and he says that at 1676 at Bacon's Rebellion, this is when the property owners come to realize, look, we got to we've got to make this thing about race and not about class. All right, if we're going to hang on to this thing, because they came very close to losing it. I mean, Bacon burned Jamestown to the ground, right? Those folks. So they're trying to they're trying to figure that out. If they go in with the Indians and with the blacks, we're going to be in trouble. So the idea was to privilege the whites, no matter how poor they were, right, that they would be over to others and find other ways, laws and so forth, to keep people apart. You know, so... Uh, but they, they they were cruelly treated. I mean, they were branded. They they were beaten. The the women oftentimes, like uh, the African women, they were raped. They could not have children without permission of the owner. There were all sorts of things that people we don't have open and honest conversations about what happened to the indentures. They ran off. The Africans, man, they were right there with them, running with them. And when they got with the Native Americans, you know, Edmund Morgan says many of them refused to go back. To go back and rejoin, this is during the colonial period, you know, those, the, those societies, because they oftentimes were struggling so much to survive in those communities, right? So that is another interesting aspect of, of that history. It is, to me, in almost every sense, white slavery, except in name, you know, in terms of the treatment of the people, in terms of the treatment of many of them.